Hey there, welcome back to another video on construction grammar and its application to English. In this video I'd like to talk about chapter 10 which has the title Constructions Across Grammars and the title already suggests that we won't just be talking about English, we'll talk about situations where more than one language is at play, that is situations of bilingualism or language contact or second language learning. And these are issues that construction grammar hasn't really focused on all that much. Yeah? And there's a reason for that. Um, so the main question that researchers and construction grammar are after is one that you've seen a couple of times if you've been following this series of videos, namely this one here. What do speakers know when they know a language? And you will notice that the way this question is phrased is with language in the singular, a language. So, um, now of course, many speakers have knowledge of several languages. They might have acquired several languages from birth, or they learned a foreign language or two later in their life. So, in other words, their knowledge of language is more than a network of constructions from a single language, which is what we've been talking about all this time. So. This, of course, raises a number of questions that we need to talk about. So, how are constructions organized in speakers with several languages? Is there one big network of constructions associated with different languages, or are there several different networks? Yeah? And if there are several ones, are they completely independent? from each other, or are they in some way connected? Are there links between constructions that belong to different languages? And if there are links, well, what is the nature of these links? What kinds of constructions are linked? Are words connected? Are syntactic patterns connected? Morphological patterns? How does that work? Okay. Um, do constructions from different languages affect each other? So let's say that your L1 is English, and then you decide that you want to learn a second language like German, and you discover that, oh well, um, English has a ditransitive construction and German has one too. Does it mean that I can project my knowledge of the English ditransitive construction into the German ditransitive construction? Um, how does that work? Yeah. And then, uh, what processes are at work when constructions from different languages are combined into a single utterance? Yeah? So, when you have code switching, speakers using several languages in the same utterance or in the same conversation. What, how does that work? Is there a systematicity to it? Or is that just a wild mixture of languages? Okay. These are things that we need to look into, and um, if we are serious about addressing constructions of gram uh, constructions across grammars, um, we actually have the good fortune that we can turn to research that has gathered insights into topics such as bilingualism and multilingualism, language contact in different cultural situations, and second language acquisition in the classroom and in the wild. Yeah. So I mentioned in my discussion of uh, variationist sociolinguistics that there's a lot that construction grammar can actually learn from research that's already out there. Here it I could make a very similar argument. Yeah? So lots of research on bilingualism, language contact, and second language acquisition that wasn't necessarily constructional in its outlook provides us with insights that we can um, co-opt for constructional thinking. And that's what I'll be trying to do in this video. All right, so let's go. Um, there are three issues that I want to talk about. I'll start with uh, what has been called diasystematic construction grammar. And in the second part, I will discuss some relevant findings from constructional research into second language acquisition. And in the third part, I will look at typological differences between languages and how those differences affect L2 learners. Okay, so let's go and start with uh, diasystematic construction grammar. And diasystematic construction grammar is largely 
um, a project that has been developed by Steffen Höder in several publications. I've listed three of them here. There are a couple more. I strongly encourage you to um, find them online. Yeah. Steffen is a specialist on Scandinavian languages and Low German. So you see there's a map of Scandinavia here and Low German would be spoken down here in this area. Yeah, uh, I met Stefan in Hamburg. We, we studied together for a while, actually. And uh, yeah, <laughs> um, so at the heart of diasystematic construction grammar is the insight that speakers that are bilingual or that speak several varieties of a language, they cannot help but notice similarities and correspondences across the languages that they're using. Let me give you a few examples. If we compare two languages that are closely related, such as English and German, we find similarities at basically every level of linguistic structure. So we find it in the lexicon. English has uh, the nouns Schuh, Bier and Book, which correspond to the German nouns Schuh, Bier, Buch. And while you don't have to be a genius to notice that, wow, those sound almost exactly the same. And of course, as a second language learner, you would notice that and immediately go, huh, that's how you pronounce this word in this other language. But it doesn't stop at the lexicon. So if we go to the level of inflectional morphology, English marks the past tense um, with a little suffix that attaches to verbs. And that suffix consists mainly of an alveolar stop. Yeah, the, the D that we have here. And German has something very similar. Okay, so again, as a learner, you would notice that and go, all right, so I think I've got that figured out. English and German share even structures that go further back historically, so they both uh, share Ablaut patterns, such as the one that you see here, sing, sang, sung. In German, it's singen, sang, gesungen. It is the same thing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we have syntactic patterns that match up, including, for example, prepositional phrases on the street. The sequence of preposition, determiner, noun is the same in German. And then there are grammatical distinctions, such as, for example, definiteness and indefiniteness. And these are indicated, these are marked in parallel ways in the two languages. So English has two kinds of determiners, one that we call the indefinite, one that we call the definite. And lo and behold, German has a parallel distinction uh, that we can see here. Not all languages have this, yeah, but uh, here the parallels are just striking. Okay, um, <clears throat> when learners notice this, or when bilingual speakers notice this, um, we call this process interlingual identification. Interlingual identification has been defined as the judgment that something in the native language and something in the target language are similar. And the outcome of interlingual identification is knowledge about language, that is metalinguistic knowledge. So a bilingual speaker does not only know that English book and German Buch mean the same thing, uh, that speaker also knows that English and German are similar with regard to this word, but not with regard to all words. Okay, so in fact, one very important aspect of interlingual identification is the detection of non matching material. Let's look at this. So, just to take one example, German has what linguists call a TV distinction. There are two second person singular pronouns, one that's more informal, to be used between friends, and the other is more polite, more distanced, and this distinction is not expressed in a parallel way in English. So bilingual speakers don't just know what matches between their languages, they're also aware of mismatches, and one thing that you can come up through this kind of reasoning is that one language may have a missing element. Okay, there's something that's not there in this language that is present in another language that I'm using. Right, um, so the elements that do match, they become associated, and Stefan Hüter calls these associations 
diasystematic links. So basically, interlingual identification gives rise to diasystematic links. Speakers see similarities, they form associations, they form connections. And these connections, they can connect elements at basically every level of linguistic structure, including the lexicon, yeah, uh, morphological structures like intersectional affixes, uh, syntactic structures, so the prepositional phrase pattern, but uh, even at levels that are below the level of constructions. Um, interlingual identification and diasystematic links are possible. Uh, Stefan has a very interesting paper where he explores this question for phonemic diasystematic links. So if you're looking at um, German words that start with PF, okay, Pfund, Pfennig, Pflaume, those uh, tend to correspond to English words that start only with a P, pound, penny, plum, okay, and you can kind of see the generalization. Of course, it's not perfect, yeah, um, but it's there. It's a partial generalization that speakers make. Okay, so Generally, the idea of diasystematic links, associations across languages that are driven by correspondences, that is a relatively straightforward and possibly non-controversial idea. Nobody would really argue against that. But what's maybe more of a novelty in Hüder's uh, theory is a concept that he calls diaconstructions. So diaconstructions are constructions across grammars, they're generalizations that speakers make across constructions that exist in individual languages or in individual linguistic varieties. Let's look at an example. So in both English and German, there's a construction that we call the uh, noun phrase construction, a very general syntactic pattern. And uh, this pattern exists in similar form in English and in German. So Hüder has a term for language-specific constructions, which he calls idioconstructions. That's what you see on either side of the slide. There's an English noun phrase construction and there is a German noun phrase construction. And um, in both English and in German, noun phrases can take a variety of different shapes. And some of these you see here. So let's start with English. In English, you can say the cat determiner noun a new idea, so modification with an adjective. Uh, you can have things like Belgian chocolate, so no determiner, but a modifier. Dogs that bark, a noun with a relative clause, or just uh, a single pronoun like theirs. That's a noun phrase too. <clears throat> so um, despite this variety, English and German match up rather well, yeah, so that Almost every English variant of a noun phrase can be mapped onto a corresponding German noun phrase. And this makes it a very seductive idea that everything you can do in an English noun phrase, you can also do in similar form in German. And this, of course, motivates a generalization across the two idiom constructions, which in Hüder's terminology would be a dia construction. That's what you see here. So these two idiom constructions feed into a generalization that uh, would be a noun phrase construction that is no longer marked for any specific language, but that represents a generalization across English and German. That is a dia construction, a construction across grammars. Now, of course, some aspects of the idiom constructions don't match up. So this includes uh, noun phrases with object relative clauses in English. So in uh, examples like the example he gave, here English allows the omission of the relativizer that. Uh, so the example that he gave corresponds to the example he gave. I can leave out the that. And that is not possible in German. Yeah? For some weird reason, the Germans don't like it. Das Beispiel ergab, that's not a functioning German noun phrase. So some things you can do in English, you cannot do in German, and vice versa. So in German, I can say things like die von Obama enttäuschten Wähler, which would translate into the by Obama disappointed voters. So there's a prepositional phrase that modifies a uh, participle, and uh, that I can't do in English. I'd have to say the voters that were disappointed by Obama. Right, so 
<clears throat> the moral here is that not all instantiations of an idio construction have to match up. The correspondences needn't be perfect. It's just that there needs to be a sufficient number of instantiations where interlingual identification is possible, where after a certain amount of time, the learner um, proceeds to form the dia construction, the generalization across languages. Okay, so now that you have a general idea of what dia constructions are, let's talk a bit about how they arise. And uh, Hürde envisions this as a three-step process that starts with interlingual identification. So in the first step, speakers perceive similarities between constructions and they create diasystematic links. Um, so to stay with the noun phrase example here, speakers encounter all these matching structures <clears throat> and through interlingual identification, they create associations, diasystematic links, and if enough links of this kind are established, then speakers realize that there are entire configurations of elements mapping onto each other, which makes it worth their while to form a dia construction, a generalization across idio constructions. Okay, um, so that would be step two in the process. You make a generalization across the idio constructions, and uh, that gives rise to the dia construction. So in the speaker's knowledge, there's now a generalization that is not specific to any given language, but rather a cross-linguistic generalization. How do we know it's there? Well, speakers don't just form it, they also do things with it, and that's when it becomes uh, apparent. So <clears throat> a telltale sign of a dia construction is what has been called positive and negative transfer. In positive transfer, knowledge of the L1 idioconstruction supports usage of the L2 idioconstruction, even in variants that the speaker has not observed up to that point. Let's take an example. So, um, a German-speaking learner of English might draw on the knowledge that in German there are noun phrases with participles as modifiers. So, die geschälten Karotten, that means uh, the peeled carrots. And in this case, the speaker is lucky because this actually works, okay? So, you can project from your knowledge of German how English would solve the same structural problem, okay? And in this case, it just happens to work out. <clears throat> There's also negative transfer, which is the unlucky cousin of uh, positive transfer. So there, learners form dia constructions that are either too restrictive. Yeah? So if my language doesn't allow this variant, I'm not going to use it in the other language. Or the dia construction can be too permissive. So there's something I can do in my language that I project into the other language, despite the fact that in the other language it doesn't really work. Um, <clears throat> so, um, Let's uh, take this example again, the example he gave. So here, a speaker of English could extrapolate from English uh, based on what's possible in their L1. And uh, they might say, das Beispiel er gab in German, and this does not result in a working German noun phrase. Or, um, <clears throat> well, the uh, speaker of English might be aware that you can't really uh, say the by Obama disappointed voters and so they will never produce uh, this kind of structure that is possible for German speakers to use. Okay, So they would have to observe that directly, realize that okay something is possible in German that I can't do in English and then they would do it. Yeah? But uh, the dia construction itself does not license uh, this kind of construct. Right, um, where it gets really interesting is Hürde's third step, which leads to the reorganization of linguistic knowledge. And here, some of the information that is stored at the level of idio constructions becomes redundant and uh, dia constructions partially replace that information. Let me explain 
how this works. So Höder calls this process pro-diasystematic change. And um, he associates this with the principle of economy. Okay, we want to make things simple and we want to generalize in order to simplify our life. So bilingual speakers gravitate towards a state that maximizes similarities between their two languages. And as a consequence, some L1 idio constructions may become extended. They may lose some of their constraints. Speakers may use them in ways that other L1 speakers might find strange. Let me give you an example for that. So German has a reflexive verb, sich wundern, roughly translates into marvel um, or wonder. Yeah? And uh, sich wundern is in fact partially synonymous with the English verb to wonder. Both of these are idioconstructions, and some of their uses are up for interlingual identification. For example, I wonder sometimes. That might translate roughly into ich wundere mich manchmal. Uh, I wonder about those two. Ich wundere mich über die beiden. That might be a translation for this. Um, now, the two verbs also differ in some of their respective syntactic behaviors. So English wonder can function as a complement-taking verb that projects an if clause, as in I wonder if they have arrived. Now, um, the corresponding German example, ich wundere mich, ob sie angekommen sind, is actually a matter of some controversy when you ask German speakers. So here I found a discussion on the internet and someone uh, asked if uh, ich wundere mich, ob sie kommen werden. Uh, is that okay? Is that something that you can say? And here we have two helpful people uh, leaving their comments and they both say, no, it's not, or you shouldn't say this, or, well, there are better ways of expressing this idea. And um, yeah, I can totally, I, I, I can see the point, except that uh, well, I'm a speaker of German and I have spent time in English speaking surroundings for a while. And so I'm totally guilty of using sich wundern in exactly this way, never thinking twice about it. Okay, so for English German bilinguals, this would be totally fine. But what it means is that, okay, my L1 has been compromised. Yeah? It's been corrupted. It has been Englishified, if that is a word. So what this means is that. I have a dia construction that has replaced some of the knowledge that I used to have as a monolingual speaker of German a long, long time ago. Okay, so summing up uh, what I wanted to say about dia systematic construction grammar it approaches multilingualism from a constructional perspective, it only uses existing elements of the constructicon, of the theoretical apparatus that we have, that is, four-meaning pairs, links between those four-meaning pairs, and gen generalizations across four-meaning pairs. And what's especially nice is that it makes testable predictions, namely it makes this claim that change should be pro diasystematic bilingual speakers should maximize similarities between their languages, create dia constructions wherever this is possible, and reorganize their linguistic knowledge. Um, now, all of this is, of course, rather theory-driven, and it would be important to see in future years how these ideas can be supported with more empirical evidence. So, constructional research into second language acquisition has actually made some headway in this direction, so let me say a few things about that. And, um, well, <clears throat> do second language learners have constructions. Uh, there's a paper by Stefan Gries and Steffi Wolf with this title, and given everything I've said up to this point, this may seem like a strange question to ask. So linguistic knowledge, of course, is knowledge of constructions, so this should be the same across L1, L2, or any other language you learn, right? Well, um, when you consider the question, there are a few arguments that could be made for postulating differences between L1 knowledge and L2 knowledge, and these we need to address. Okay, So for example, L2 learning 
takes place in different settings than L1 acquisition. Often there is explicit rule-based instruction, there's feedback, there's correction, and so this might leave an imprint on the kind of knowledge that you acquire of the L2. We should also acknowledge that the outcome of L2 learning is imperfect in most cases. Yeah? So L2 accents uh, remain in speakers' pronunciations and phonology. There's fossilization in morphology and in syntax. So pretty much no matter how hard you try, you will always be identified as an L2 learner. Sad. Yeah? Now, given these differences, it's necessary to provide some evidence for the assumption that L2 knowledge is essentially like L1 knowledge, albeit perhaps not as profound, not as fully developed as your L1 knowledge. So let's look into this. Um, Gries and Wolf conducted a study that uh, probed whether L2 learners are sensitive to the process of syntactic priming in the same way that L1 speakers are. So the argument would be, well, if L2 learners show the same processes at work, the same cognitive processes, then we would have an argument to say that, okay, their cognitive representations of language should correspond in some way because, well, they are susceptible to the same cognitive processes. So what uh, Gries and Wolf did is that they replicated a design by Pickering and Brannigan, who had been using a sentence completion task with stimuli that exemplify the constructions of the dative alternation. Now, I seem to remember that I promised to never talk about the dative alternation again. I'm afraid I have to break that promise here. So the dative alternation comprises the ditransitive construction, John gave Mary the book, and the prepositional dative construction, John gave the book to Mary. And these constructions are at play in these configurations of sentence fragments here. So in each trial, participants saw two sentence fragments and they had to complete each one in whatever way they thought most reasonable. And uh, if you want to, you can pause this video here and see for yourself how you would complete these two sentences. Yeah, So do fragment one first and then do fragment two. Okay, I will continue now. Um, now, of course, there's a priming relation at issue here. Uh, the first fragment biases people in a very specific way. Namely, the first object here, the helpful mechanic, is a human being, an animate being, someone who is alive. And this strongly biases people towards the ditransitive construction. Yeah? So people would be likely to say things like the racing driver gave the helpful mechanic a thumbs up. So the bias is induced by the animate object and it induces a bias towards the ditransitive construction. And then the use of the ditransitive construction would be a prime for uh, the target that we have in fragment two. So the patient showed can be continued in two different ways with the ditransitive or the prepositional dative. But since we just use the ditransitive, there should be a bias towards using also the ditransitive in fragment two. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, of course, there were stimuli that were exactly the other way around. So in uh, fragment one in this trial, we have object one, which would be an inanimate object. The racing driver gave the torn overall which would include uh, induce a bias uh, towards the prepositional data. So uh, participants would be likely to say things like the racing driver gave the torn overall to the mechanic. So we have an instance of the prepositional dative. And as a result, we should also see a bias towards the prepositional dative in fragment two. Okay, so all of this has been documented very well for native speakers of English. So does it also work for L2 learners of English. Gries and Wolf show that it actually does. So syntactic priming is fully evident in their data. If the prime is the prepositional dative, we find more 
prepositional dativs in fragment two than we would expect. Um, and if the prime is the ditransitive, we find more ditransitives with fragment two than we would expect by chance. So, um, so far as language production is concerned, it looks like L2 learners draw on constructional knowledge that doesn't seem all that different from the knowledge that L1 learners operate with. There's another study that Gris and Wolf conducted in which they tested whether L2 learners rate the acceptability of sentences in a way that corresponds to the conventionality of those examples. So um, they devised an acceptability rating task where they presented participants with uh, different complement clause constructions involving two infinitives and in clauses. So many verbs in English can be used with both types. So the verb try, for instance, I can use with either a two infinitive or with an in clause. I can say John tried to talk to his mother or I can say John tried talking to his mother. Um, however, the mere fact that I can use both of these doesn't mean that both are equally conventional. So many verbs are associated to either one or the other. Well, um, so the crucial variable in this experiment was the association between the so-called matrix verb, in this case try, and the complement type. Uh, is it a two infinitive or is it an in clause? And um, <clears throat> uh, Case and Wolf used a method that is called colostructional analysis or colexeme analysis. Um, there's a video about this, link in the description below if you want to check that out. Um, so the stimuli were designed in such a way that uh, there were examples with verbs such as try, like, or continue, which are statistically strongly associated with the two infinitive construction. Okay, They occur with this construction much more often than would be expected by chance. And uh, other stimuli included verbs that appear exclusively with two infinitives and not at all with in clauses. And of course, vice versa, there were uh, stimuli with verbs that are strongly associated with in clauses, start, stop, finish, and with verbs that exclusively take in clause complements, but not two infinitive complements. Right, the question of course is, do learners rate these stimuli better if there is a good fit between the verb and the construction, statistically speaking, rather than a poor fit. And it seems uh, to be the case that yes, they do. In this graph, you see rating results for four different types of stimuli. Up here, we have stimuli with in clauses uh, that were paired with an in clause uh, colleague scene, such as, for instance, start. Okay, Start likes to occur with in clauses, and when you see the two together, well, the learners rated these very positively. Similarly, um, here we have stimuli with two infinitives, and uh, they received high ratings when they were paired with a two infinitive colleague scene, something like try. Okay, try likes to occur with two infinitives, and if you see the two together, high ratings. Down here, you see the combinations that mismatch, okay? Not because they're grammatically wrong, but because they're not as conventional, they're not as mutually associated as the um, pairings that we have up here. So stimuli with in clauses receive lower ratings when in them we have a two infinitive colic seam such as try. Yeah? Or down here, we have stimuli with two infinitives with an in-clause colic seam, such as start. Yeah? So this means that speakers, well, L2 learners, are sensitive to these patterns of associations, and that would indicate that learners and native speakers really access the same kind of knowledge in experiments, both in online language processing, so we've looked at a priming experiment, and at a sentence completion um, experiment, 
We've looked at offline tasks such as acceptability rating tasks, and there are other studies that I haven't talked about but that I would be happy to talk about where um, the sortings that learners produce indicate that they are sensitive to the same kind of processes that affect L1 speakers. Right, so L2 learners, yes, they have constructions. I'm coming to the third and final part of this video, namely typological differences and their effects on L2 learners. And um, earlier on I talked about interlingual identification, which obviously works rather well when you have two languages that are genetically close and that share lots of structural characteristics. Um, it might get harder when the languages are not as similar or when they even have opposing characteristics. So in that kind of scenario, the um, detection of matches is actually less powerful, but the mechanism that kicks in is the detection of mismatches, which really brings forward uh, knowledge of the L2. Now, let's work with a concrete example. Um, a distinction that many of you will be familiar with is Len Telmy's distinction between verb-framed and satellite-framed languages, which concerns the expression of motion events in the world's languages. So the whole story, of course, is a lot more complex than uh, I can discuss here, but it's fair to draw a basic distinction between languages such as English, in which you find quite a few uh, movement verbs that incorporate an aspect of manner, such as the verb roll. And then there are languages such as Spanish, which feature movement verbs that simultaneously encode a path, but not manner. <clears throat> so there's ample evidence that this typological distinction has cognitive repercussions, uh, amongst other things. Speakers of satellite-framed languages are more likely to conflate movement and manner in a single co-speech gesture. So uh, you see here the speaker is making a spiraling movement away from uh, the speaker's own body. So that would be a conflation of movement and manner. <clears throat> now, does the difference between verb-framed and satellite-framed matter? for L2 learning of constructions? That's a relevant question that we should look at. And uh, Ute Römer and colleagues have investigated this question with another sentence completion task that they gave to German, Czech, and Spanish learners of English. So German and Czech are satellite framed, like English, and Spanish is verb framed. And the participants had to complete sentence fragments such as she blank towards the or it <coughs> blank between the or he blank through the. And of course, lots of verbs can be used in these fragments. So she walked towards the door or it fell between the cracks or he rolled through the grass. You know? Um, lots of ways in which you can fill in uh, the blank here. And Römer and colleagues wanted to find out how well the learners approximated the usage of native speakers of English. Okay, Do learners choose the same verbs that a control group of uh, native speakers of English um, do? Yeah? So in the graph on this slide, you can see how the learners performed. So you see three languages, uh, L1 German, L1 Czech, and L1 Spanish. And uh, for each language, you see the different prepositions that were used in the fragments. So towards, into, across, against, as, among, in, over, and so on and so forth. So if a preposition is high up, that means that the verbs that the learners chose lined up rather nicely with uh, what you could find in a yeah, uh, native English corpus or in the usage of native speakers. <clears throat> and if a preposition is uh, relatively far down the, uh, the y-axis, that would mean that the verbs do not really line up. So the learners chose verbs that are very different from what speakers of English chose. Right, um, 
So on the whole, you can see that the German prepositions here, uh, the German learners perform most native-like and the Spanish learners are least native-like and the Czech learners are sort of sandwiched in between. And uh, interestingly, the verbs that are responsible for this difference across the languages are related to the distinction of verb framed and satellite framed. So Spanish learners, they overuse path verbs such as go, pass, come, and move, and they underuse manner verbs such as jump, climb, climb, and, and hop. Yeah? So this indicates that argument structure constructions are acquired in a way that reflects typological characteristics of the L1. <clears throat> I'd like to raise one more issue with regard to argument structure constructions and typological characteristics. One question that we can ask is whether argument structure constructions are equally flexible across languages. Now, English is uh, very, very flexible. And in a study that Florent Perec and I conducted, we introduced a concept that we called constructional tolerance. Okay, what do we mean by that? So as a preliminary definition, constructional tolerance would describe how easy it is for speakers to tolerate unusual or creative combinations of lexical items and syntactic frames. So for instance, if we take the well-known example of the verb uh, sneeze, we can state that the most typical syntactic frame for a sneeze is simply intransitive usage with a human subject, as in John sneezed. Um, now, the notion of constructional tolerance describes how easy it is for speakers to vary the syntactic environments of sneeze. So, for example, speakers might use sneeze in um, a construction of directed action and say John sneezed all over his laptop. They might come up with a cognate object construction, such as John sneezed a mighty sneeze, or they might use it in a resultative way, John sneezed his cat soaking wet, or in a uh, caused motion construction, John sneezed the napkin off the table. <clears throat> now, a high degree of constructional tolerance would imply that lexical items, mostly verbs, but also other projecting elements, show a very varied and flexible valency repertoire. And with that preliminary definition of constructional tolerance in place, we can now ask another question, namely, um, is constructional tolerance similar across different languages? So put in a slightly different way, is constructional tolerance perhaps a useful typological parameter that can distinguish between different types of languages? So for instance, you could imagine that there are constructional languages in which lexical elements generally can appear across a wide range of morphosyntactic contexts. And on the other hand, there might be what we could call valency languages, that is languages in which lexical elements are largely restricted to a few conventionalized syntactic frames that are stored in the mental lexicon. Most work on construction grammar, of course, has been done on English, and not coincidentally, perhaps, the English language is somewhat notorious for being a constructional language. <clears throat> so intransitive verbs can appear in, uh, in, in resultative constructions, uh, transitive constructions can appear with null instantiated objects. Nouns can be made into verbs. Uh, count nouns can appear as mass nouns. Verbing can affect adjectives, and so on and so forth. I mean, you know the deal. <clears throat> but one example of a less constructional language would be French. And anecdotally, most of the English examples that I presented earlier are not easily translated into French. So for example, where English uses the same verb uh, combined with different constructions to describe events of spraying, French uses three different verbs. And in addition, these verbs can not easily be used in other syntactic patterns. Okay, so each verb is associated to one syntactic frame. <clears throat> right. So, how can you test this? Um, 
how can one test for differences in constructional tolerance? Um, so this is a study that Florent and I did when we both were in Germany at the Freiburg University, and we were able to take advantage of the large population of exchange students uh, coming to Freiburg. There are many international students that, that come to Freiburg and that use that opportunity to learn German. And so we reasoned that we could take a group of students with English L1 and another group with French L1 and test how both groups react to more or less creative uh, stimuli in a third language, namely German. And what we hoped was that our groups of participants would react differently to German stimuli and that these differences would reflect the constructional tolerance that the participants have from their L1. So to illustrate this idea, um, <clears throat> let's say the student are confronted with a good German sentence such as uh, die Helfer wühlen sich durch den Schutt, the helpers are digging their way through the rubble. Um, they should all be fine with that. Yeah? <clears throat> um, if we now take a relatively creative sentence such as uh, die Ratte nagt sich in die Speisekammer, we have a rat gnawing its way into the pantry. Some participants might find that example quite acceptable. Yeah? and others might be a little more skeptical. Now, if we take something really, really strange that German speakers would consider completely ungrammatical, uh, such as uh, die Pflanze wächst sich ins Fenster, the plant grows its way into the window. So as a German, I can, I can say that. Yeah? Uh, we might find the whole range of judgments from fully acceptable to not so sure to completely unacceptable. And our starting hypothesis was that the difference in judgments could be related to the respective L1. That is, we expected that on the whole, native speakers of French would judge our creative examples a little more harshly, a little more conservatively. And the Americans, the British speakers, the Canadians, Australians, and everyone else that we uh, got our hands on would be relatively more generous in their judgments. And we also had a control group of Germans who we thought might make judgments that are somewhere between those two. Okay, um, how do we design that experiment? Um, so <clears throat> we uh, chose to take four different construction types. We uh, used ditransitive stimuli. So der Vater schenkt ihm eine Bohrmaschine. That means the father gives him a an electric drill, um, <clears throat> caused motion constructions, die Retter brachten den Mann in eine Klinik, the first responders brought the man into a hospital, the conative construction, uh, der Spieler tritt nach dem Ball, the, the player kicks at the ball, and then a construction that we call the reflexive way construction, and that you've seen before, die Helfer wühlen sich durch den Schutt, the helpers are making, are, are digging their way through the rubble, okay? So all of these are conventional and acceptable sentences of English, but we also constructed some more creative or even unexpect, unacceptable examples like der Professor denkt uns eine Erklärung, the professor thinks us an explanation. Um, okay, so that, that's not something that you can actually say, that's bad. Uh, but from a semantic perspective, it's good. Yeah? So professors, they're supposed to give explanations. So it's not because of a semantic incongruity that this example is bad. It's just because um, think is not, or denken, that's not a verb that you can use in the German ditransitive construction. Okay, similarly, uh, in the conative construction, the player kicks at the ball, that is fine. The gardener waters at the plant is not, okay? The gardener waters the plant, that is fine, but uh, you cannot water at the plant. Um, that's, yeah, unconventional. Okay, um, so uh, all in all, we had uh, 25 sentences per construction, so 100 examples in total. Three groups of participants, uh, 
a control group of Germans, uh, native speakers of English, native speakers of French, and we tested their lexical knowledge with a vocabulary test. In the experiment itself, the participants saw the stimuli sentences, and for each sentence they had to make a judgment as to its grammatical quality. Instead of a seven-point scale, we chose a colored bar uh, that showed a continuum from green to red, and what was recorded was the precise horizontal position on that bar where the participants clicked with the mouse. Okay, what do we find? The main overall result was that the German control group, seen here in yellow, uh, they gave consistently more generous ratings than both the French and the English group. Yeah? So what you see in this graph are the three groups, yellow, blue, red, and the four different constructions, the reflexive way construction, the ditransitive construction, the conative construction, and the cause and motion construction. And it turned out that our theory was right for exactly one construction out of the four, namely the um, reflexive way construction. So here, the French speakers are more conservative, the English speakers are more permissive, <clears throat> And that's exactly what uh, we uh, hypothesized, what we would see. However, for the ditransitive, mirror image. Yeah? So it's the French that are more permissive, and the English speakers are more restrictive. And then we have two constructions, the conative construction and the cost motion construction, where we don't see much of a difference at all. Okay, so that is a very mixed bag of results, if you like. So we try to make sense of this. Um, and uh, one explanation, for example, for, for the pattern in the ditransitive, would be that um, the English ditransitive construction is a lot more restrictive uh, than the German ditransitive construction, which can appear, for example, with benefactive meanings. Okay, so I closed him the door, if that was his wish. That's totally possible in German, but it's kind of iffy in English, right? Okay, so um, the overall conclusion then was that a constructionally prolific L1, such as English, does not automatically lead to constructional tolerance in general. Um, our statistical analysis showed that the different groups are tolerant towards different constructions, so the French speakers accept creative ditransitives, and the English speakers accept creative reflexives, and uh, this can be explained in part with the role of individual construction. So the L2 is acquired against the backdrop of individual L1 constructions, and if that L1 construction happens to be um, highly productive, then you're likely to accept more creative examples also in the L2. Okay, I'm trying to draw some general conclusions here about constructions across grammars. Bilingualism, language contact, second language acquisition, uh, these are issues that represent current frontiers in constructional research. Some research is out there, yeah, uh, but a lot more remains to be done. Some important concepts that can provide guidance on the way are the concepts of dia constructions and of dia systematic links, where speakers actively look for similarities between their languages uh, and their linguistic knowledge undergoes pro diasystematic change. So we look for similarities, and once we've discovered a similarity, that actually affects our language specific knowledge and some of our language-specific knowledge may be replaced by generalizations, so-called dia constructions. Um, the empirical evidence that I've reviewed in this video also indicates that L2 knowledge is usefully seen as knowledge of constructions, and uh, typological characteristics, including productivity and the semantic breadth of uh, L1 constructions, can affect how L2 constructions are learned and used. All right, that's it for this video. Thanks a lot, and see you soon. Bye.